Hello, good uh, afternoon, good evening, good morning to everyone. Welcome to uh, Symposium 4 of this Apache Congress, Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis. I am uh, Dr. Lee Bihua from Singapore, and together with uh, Paxton Lok from uh, Melbourne, we both will chair this meeting. We have a panel of four very learned speakers, and we have very little time. So without further ado, I will have the honor of uh, introducing Professor Mimi Tang. She is, I think, very well known to all of us. She needs no introduction. Um, her forte is in food allergy and she comes from the University of Melbourne. Uh, she will start off with the, um, with the symposium, Food Immunotherapy Outcomes. Mimi, the floor is yours. So today I'll be speaking on food immunotherapy outcomes. I think this is a very important topic because food immunotherapy is an emerging field. Uh, most of us uh, in practice today will not have covered this topic during our training. And we only had the first food immunotherapy approved last year, Palforsia, the first uh, oral immunotherapy drug for peanut allergy. And we know that there's a second drug in late stage development that's expected to be approved in the coming year, uh, Viaskin peanut patch. I think what we need to do then is to have a good understanding as a community of uh, physicians and uh, um, allied health specialists that are supporting families in managing food allergy, uh, uh, have a good understanding and consensus around the different treatment outcomes. So today what I'd like to do is very briefly touch on the definitions of the different outcomes. This is of course evolving still, so what I present today is a little bit what I see as the landscape um, and that may well, well evolve in the coming years. I will also look at the benefits and risks associated with each of the different outcomes because this is something that I don't think is well studied. And finally, consider which patient groups we might think about as benefiting from therapies that offer the different outcomes. So let's start with the landscape. We have desensitization, sustained unresponsiveness, also known as remission, long-term sustained unresponsiveness or prolonged remission, and of course, tolerance. Now, these are all terms that can be quite confusing. Many people interchangeably use the word desensitization with immunotherapy, which is not possible in the case of food allergy. So what do we mean? Desensitization is where you are basically temporarily increasing the amount of food you can eat before you have a reaction. So you're increasing the reaction threshold. And to show that you've desensitized someone, you have to actually do a challenge before and after and show that the threshold has shifted in an upward direction. What this gives to the patient is protection against accidental exposure, but they must remain on therapy and they must continue strict avoidance. Sustained unresponsiveness is the next level of um, at treatment outcome. Here we're talking about a lack of clinical reaction. And what do we mean by this? I take it to mean a lack of reaction to a standard diagnostic food challenge. So the absence of clinical reactivity. And this should be demonstrated after treatment has been stopped for at least some months. At this time, there's no consensus amongst uh, KOLs or regulatory bodies as to how long this test needs to be, um, how long after treatment is stopped before we do this test. But publications typically use four weeks to 12 weeks at this time. And in our hands, in our research group, we use an eight week post-treatment test, which I feel is a reasonably robust measure because it allows us some confidence that the desensitization effect has washed away. So if we show that a child passes a diagnostic challenge eight weeks post-treatment, we feel confident that they have achieved sustained unresponsiveness, also referred to as remission. Now, what does this mean for the patient? In our hands, we allow our patients to eat peanut, uh, eat allergen freely. We um, believe it's a lasting therapy effect, so we do not continue treatment, and the patient no longer has to avoid allergen. 
Now, in our studies, we've been able to follow up patients years after uh, they've stopped therapy and monitored how they've gone in the remission state. And we've identified a further um, outcome that we term as long-term sustained unresponsiveness or prolonged remission. And this is where years after stopping treatment, with ad libitum intake in the intervening years, we repeat the remission test. We take children off their allergen for eight weeks. We repeat a standard diagnostic challenge. If they pass that, it means we can't demonstrate presence of allergy at that time. And we consider they have um, long-term sustained unresponsiveness. And essentially they can continue to eat allergen freely. We know that they have a long lasting protection, no need to avoid the food and they can remain off therapy. Now tolerance is really something that's an immunological state. It's a permanent cure um, or natural resolution. And frankly, I don't think any treatment in development will achieve this um, tolerance endpoint because it's very difficult to show convincingly a permanent effect in a clinical trial setting. So um, really the questions that are out, uh, still outstanding in this situation are uh, how do these children actually do in the years after we have either desensitized them or induced remission and there's actually very little data out there partly because there are few well designed studies evaluating these endpoints largely related to the drugs that are in uh, commercialization um, stage or um, approved so i've only really got a couple of slides here. The things we're going to focus on are efficacy. So what happens to efficacy? Is desensitization improved, lost? What happens there? And what about safety? What about the reactions that patients have? Because we know that during the desensitization phase, patients have lots of reactions. But let's look at some real world data from follow on studies. So this slide shows you a follow-on study of the Palforsia drug, which has now been approved. This is results after an additional 12 months of therapy um, or six months of therapy. And the takeaway message without laboring on it is continued treatment, if it's given daily, improves efficacy. A higher proportion of patients achieve desensitization. If you do not take your treatment daily and you drop it to twice a week, you don't get as good um, a benefit on efficacy. Looking at safety, continued treatment daily does look as if it reduces reaction rates. But what's concerning is you don't get fewer withdrawals, withdrawal rates remain high, systemic reactions remain the same as the first year of therapy, and the number of subjects needing epinephrine also remains the same as the first year. I just present here um, a, 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 the other therapy that's in late stage development, um, PALF, uh, sorry, Viaskin Peanut. And this is a very nice study as well, because there's quite a few interesting findings here. So the original study um, was conducted for 12 months, and then this study followed patients out to a total of three years of treatment. And what they were able to show was there was improved efficacy as well. It perhaps wasn't as um, uh, convincing as with oral immunotherapy being continued for a longer period. But I found um, an outcome to be very interesting. There was evidence that patients could actually withdraw the daily peanut patch for eight weeks and maintain their desensitization level. Now, I'm coining this term sustained desensitization because they're not passing um, a standard food challenge. There is evidence they are still allergic. They are failing the challenge, but they're able to maintain a level of desensitization of therapy and for quite a lengthy period of treatment withdrawal, which is very different, I think, to the um, situation that you have with oral immunotherapy. So I think this is an um, important endpoint that we need to start thinking about because I think it will give patients meaningful um, benefit. In terms of safety, Overall, there wasn't really a change in rates of reaction, although most of these reactions are local skin reactions. However, I think there is a meaningful reduction in systemic reactions 
which are of course uh, concerning, and also a reduction in the number of subjects that needed epinephrine. Now moving on from efficacy and um, safety or reactions, we should also be very concerned about quality of life. Um, during the approval process of Palforsia, uh, the advisory committee of FDA highlighted a need for more in evidence around quality of life impact from both oral immunotherapy and epicutaneous immunotherapy with the via skin patch. And the reason for that is there really isn't a lot of data out there. At the moment, I think there's no convincing evidence compared to placebo that desensitization with oral immunotherapy provides a meaningful improvement in quality of life for patients compared with placebo. On the other hand, there is evidence in a randomized trial setting that desensitization with a peanut patch, the via skin peanut patch, improves quality of life compared with placebo. And so I think it, the point to take home here is we can't just think about the outcome on whether it provides a benefit or doesn't provide a benefit. You really have to think about it in the context of which is the treatment mode that's delivering the outcome together with the outcome that you achieve in considering the benefit to the patient. So we've already seen that there's differences in efficacy, safety, quality of life for two different treatments that both offer desensitization. So we can't just lump all desensitization outcomes in together. In terms of sustained unresponsiveness, there are really very few studies that have looked at impact on quality of life. The only study that I'm aware of that um, is published actually comes from our group and we have studied um, both immediate and long-term quality of life impact from sustained unresponsiveness and we have shown in a previous study that it persists to four years post-treatment, this benefit on quality of life. But what's still missing is there is no published data on quality of life impact comparing desensitization and sustained unresponsiveness directly. And so what I'd like to spend a bit of time on is data that we've recently generated from our research group at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And what we're, uh, I'm gonna present is looking at um, reactions to peanut, peanut intake and quality of life in children who were desensitized with oral immunotherapy and those who achieved sustained unresponsiveness with oral immunotherapy. So this data relates specifically to oral immunotherapy. Now this was a 200 patient trial comparing three different interventions, a combination probiotic peanut, peanut alone or placebo. Everybody got treatment for 18 months. We then did the tests for desensitization and remission using a standard diagnostic challenge. Kids who passed both challenges were classified as having sustained unresponsiveness and were told to incorporate peanut into their diet freely. Children who passed the first diagnostic challenge but failed the second were classified as fully desensitized to 5,000 milligrams peanut protein and were advised to continue a daily treatment dose of one to two peanuts. And then children who were not fully desensitized, whether they were actually um, fully allergic or partially desensitized, desensitized, we told them to avoid peanut. We then followed patients up at 12 months post-treatment, monitoring for those outcomes I told you about. So what did we find? We saw that actually the majority of children with sustained unresponsiveness were eating peanut freely. Most children were taking some amount of their desensitizing dose in the desensitized group, and um, allergic children were by, by and large able to avoid peanut. Amongst the remission um, sustained unresponsiveness cohort, the median amount of peanut they were eating was two to eight peanuts and median um, uh, frequency was one to twice a week. Surprising to us, almost half of them actually enjoyed eating peanut. Another 20% didn't really love it, but were happy to eat it often. And then another 20% didn't really like it, but ate it occasionally. So it was really only a small proportion who preferred not to eat peanut at all. For our desensitization group, we had nice data because it showed that 
about 85% of kids were taking their dose most days of the week or every day, which is good. It's heartening to see that, okay, they're staying on their therapy, which keeps them relatively safe. In terms of whether they liked it, unfortunately, only 50% were happy to take their daily dose. Um, and most kids struggled to take their dose either sometimes or very often. Now I wanna focus on the reactions piece here. So this slide shows the reactions to peanut, either the peanut intake as a dose of peanut every day in the desensitized group, or pe free peanut intake as part of your um, normal diet in the sustained unresponsive group. And what you see is that the proportion of patients reacting to peanut is half in the SU remission group compared to desensitization. Both, of course, are higher than the allergic group. The number of subjects needing EpiPen is also half in our SU remission group compared to the desensitization group. So what this tells us is that I think SU remission with oral immunotherapy is definitely a better outcome than desensitization because children have fewer reactions and need less EpiPen rescue. Now, just looking at the quality of life, which I emphasized earlier to me is probably the most important endpoint to look at when we're thinking about treating food allergy, because we know reactions with avoidance are actually not frequent and deaths are even, um, are really rare. So really what you're trying to do is improve quality of life. And what we found was that there was a very significant improvement in quality of life, exceeding the minimum clinical important difference just for the SU remission patients. It was not achieved with desensitization alone um, and obviously not with um, patients who remained allergic. And when we comp compared the improvement in the different groups, there was a significantly greater improvement in our SU remission cohort compared to the desensitized patients and also compared to the allergy patients. Now, why is that meaningful, that last piece? because although these children are having reactions, 25% of them had reactions compared to only 10% in the allergy group. So although they are having twice as many reactions, the benefit that they gain in quality of life would seem to outweigh that risk. And I should have mentioned that most reactions, 90% of reactions that the SU group had were mild. So just to summarize, you know, we, we it looks as if Eating peanut freely in the sustained unresponsiveness group is safe and they don't, they enjoy it or don't mind it. Sustained unresponsiveness offers a better outcome than desensitization and it's the only outcome that improved quality of life with oral immunotherapy. Now I've only got two minutes left so I'm going to quickly rush through this last part of my talk but I think it's a really um, relevant piece to ponder given we are going to see more drugs being approved in the coming years and they are going to offer different outcomes to patients and we need to think about which drugs are best for the different patient groups. Now I'm using peanut allergy as an example here just to stick with the theme but what we know is that children who have food allergy have a range of sensitivity levels some are highly sensitive with lower listing doses and others are less sensitive with higher listing doses. And here you see data from um, Steve Taylor's group in Nebraska where they analyzed data from 3000 challenges or more and then mapped out the listing dose for the peanut allergy population. You see it's normally distributed. What's interesting is 300 milligrams is the median listing dose. Now, they also, in another study, looked at quantitative risk assessment, and they showed that children who have an enlisting dose of 300 milligrams or more actually have a negligible risk of reacting to peanut contaminating packaged foods or cross-contaminating other foods. So these kids are not the ones having accidental reactions, okay? 50% of kids who have an enlisting dose below 300 milligrams are having accidental reactions. And given that desensitization, the approved drug is indicated for protecting against accidental exposure, these are the patients that you might think are gonna benefit from a desensitization oral immunotherapy or patch. On the other hand, these kids up here, they're not having the ex accidental exposures, so they actually won't 
gain significant benefit from it. And you really do have to ask whether the risk of reactions uh, outweighs the benefit that they might actually um, achieve. Indeed, these patients at the moment are excluded from any clinical trials. There, are, other than our study, which is not a commercial study, um, there aren't any commercial studies that enroll children who have these lower levels of sensitivity. So what about sustained unresponsiveness? Who might benefit from that? Now we know that despite the fact there's a broad range of sensitivity levels, we currently recommend that everybody with food allergy adheres to a strict allergen avoidance diet. We also know that the lifestyle restrictions that come with allergen avoidance and the anxiety around an accidental exposure that's unpredictable cause significant distress and ultimately poor quality of life. And it seems that this aspect of allergen avoidance is a major factor driving poor quality of life because a study coming out of the US um, has shown that 60% of families report food avoidance to be extremely difficult, whereas only 30% of them reported to be um, the concerns around death to be extremely difficult. So I'm not minimizing the concern around death. What I'm trying to highlight is that the food avoidance is even more impactful than uh, the concern around death for these patients. So knowing uh, the data that we have, that sustained unresponsiveness with our oral immunotherapy regimen can provide meaningful improvement in quality of life that persists all the way to four years post-treatment. I think that you might suggest sustained unresponsiveness could benefit all patients with peanut allergy, particularly those who currently aren't suffering from accidental exposures. And one other study we did in our long-term cohort um, was to look at correlates for what gave you better improvement in quality of life. And what we found was that the, the most significant driver of improvement in quality of life was the amount of peanut that children were eating. So the more peanut that children were eating, the greater the improvement in quality of life, suggesting that there is some positive feedback for patients in, um, in terms of each time they're eating the peanut, if they don't react, they feel that they're getting um, benefit, which might be contributing to their quality of life improvement. So to close out, this was the landscape we discussed at the beginning. We know that we have an approved therapy that offers desensitization, which protects against accidental exposure. Children do need to continue avoidance and remain on treatment. There's a second drug going to be approved very soon that will offer a similar endpoint with better safety. Um, but I feel that for the future, we should, as a community um, of, of physicians, key opinion leaders, advocate for our patients in driving to find treatments that actually induce sustained unresponsiveness remission, as well as long-term sustained unresponsiveness and remission. So um, to close out, I just wanna thank uh, all of the investigators, study teams and supporting services at the MCRI, collaborators as well um, for their support in completing the, the PPO at three randomized trial from which I showed you the data today. Thank you. For our next uh, speaker um, in this symposium, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor David Fleischer, who comes from the Children's Hospital in Colorado, where he's the Professor of Pediatrics and the Section Head. Um, he's internationally renowned for his um, food allergy expertise, and today he will come to speak to us on the recent advances in immunotherapy for peanut allergy. Over to you, David. Thank you, Paxton, and I want to thank the organizers as well for inviting me to speak today. Although I look forward to speaking in person at some point since it's about four o'clock in the morning here in Denver. So currently, for most patients with peanut allergy, strict avoidance is the treatment um, of choice right now. And obviously being prepared for accidental exposures to peanut uh, with having epinephrine and other medications available if accidentally exposed. We know with uh, certain patients and some patients, we may be able to prevent the development of peanut allergy by early introduction of peanut under age one, but we'll certainly still have cases of peanut allergy occurring. And unfortunately, most patients with peanut allergy don't outgrow it. 
Uh, there are several immunotherapies that are under investigation, which may be talked about, and I'll briefly touch on OIT, sublingual, and epicutaneous immunotherapy at the end, but I talk more about those uh, on my talk uh, Sunday morning here, afternoon there. So mostly I'll focus on other therapies that are under investigation, including biologics and a couple of vaccines. And I'll make sure I get copies of the slide. So there's a lot on this slide, but the basic point of this slide is there, there are many areas in biologics uh, that are under investigation, looking at potential treatment of food allergy as well as other atopic diseases. Uh, the ones that I'll talk about and focus on today are several anti-IgE therapies, including omalizumab and ligalizumab, the IL-14, IL-13 pathway, uh, as well looking at dupilumab, and then one study I'll, I'll go over looking at IL-33 antibody and how it uh, can help with food allergy. So omalizumab or anti-IG was actually studied over 15 years ago for the treatment of peanut allergy. The study unfortunately then was, was stopped early, not because of the, um, the safety of omalizumab, but rather the safety of the food challenges, the way they were doing them in that study. In that study, they were using peanut uh, and, and capsules for the food challenges. So there were patients, unfortunately, that digested those capsules differently and two of them almost had uh, fatal reactions to the challenges. Uh, since then, there's been multiple studies, which I'll go over in the next slide, looking at omalizumab for food allergy, and now a critical phase three trial that's ongoing. But omalizumab uh, essentially binds to circulating IgE in a non-specific manner. So it could not just treat peanut allergy, it could also treat patients with multiple food allergies, so it could bind to all food-specific IgEs, therefore having potential to treat patients with multiple food allergies. By binding to it, IgE, it decreases the amount of IgE, that can interact with the high affinity uh, receptors on mast cells and basophils, and thus decreasing the expression of these high affinity receptors over time. And as a result of that, the mast cells and basophils can exhibit reduced granulation in response to an allergen like peanut. Here we look at four studies that looked at omalizumab as monotherapy. Again, mono, uh, omalizumab has been studied in conjunction with OIT as well, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, the first study was looking at the results of the initial 23 patients that were in the trial that was stopped short to the severe reactions uh, from the uh, food challenges. Um, it did show a, a 10 trend towards increased threshold compared to baseline in those patients. The second study uh, from 2012 with Savage et al. looked at 14 penal allergic patients, all treated with omalizumab every two to four weeks for 24 weeks. Here they found an increased median tolerated dose of over six grams of peanut protein um, from a baseline of only tolerating about 80 milligrams. And this is almost a full sub serving of peanut protein just after 24 weeks of omalizumab. The Branson study looked at adolescents uh, and adults and found that in 15 of the 23 or about two thirds of patients, they were able to tolerate 2.8 grams of peanut protein uh, after using omalizumab and all ingested uh, at least three peanuts for about 840 milligrams. The last trial looked at 15 multi-food allergic uh, subjects who were given omalizumab for the primary indication of treating their severe asthma. Yet during the study, they were challenged to the foods to which they were allergic to see the effect of omalizumab on those patients' food allergies. And 70% of those were able to tolerate a full serving of the foods to which they were allergic in that study. So overall, you can see from, from these studies that omalizumab works alone very well into large degrees and large amounts of protein uh, to desensitize patients um, of using it alone. Because of this, at least in the, in the U.S. in 2018, the FDA uh, granted breakthrough designation for uh, uh, studying omalizumab for approval um, to decreasing severe allergic reactions following accidental exposures to one or more foods on uh, patients with food allergies. And these were granted basically based on the data that I showed with the monotherapy, but also in combination with OIT. So the outmatch study was started uh, in 2019, unfortunately during the pandemic, and it's had some problems with recruitment due to that, the slower recruitment, but it's a multi-center study in, in the US looking at omalizumab as a monotherapy as well as an adjunct to multi-allergen OIT uh, in food allergic children and adults. The important point highlighted in red here is that about a year from now, 
hopefully the primary outcome from the stage one data will be uh, complete. So hopefully potentially approval for omalizumab as a standalone therapy coming sometime later that year, next year, or early into 2023. But uh, looking at, uh, again, the study, it's a multi-center study in patients one to 55 years of age who have at least uh, peanut allergy as well as allergy to two other foods. Uh, and those foods include milk, egg, wheat, cashew, hazelnut, or walnut. The first stage, again, looks at just omalizumab monotherapy versus placebo. The, uh, the first 60 patients that are enrolled and complete the challenge will go into an open laser extension where they'll continue on omalizumab, while the other about 160 patients will go on omalizumab in addition to multi-food OIT versus omalizumab and placebo OIT. And then the arms will continue to be followed into stage three where they'll have an open, they will uh, ongoing uh, with the different therapies to see uh, the comparison between monotherapy with OIT uh, or standalone therapy. So hopefully again, I think conclusion of stage one data, which will be sometime next year, um, it will be, uh, omalizumab will be approved for the treatment of multiple food allergies, which will include obviously patients with peanut allergy. The next step in anti-allergy therapy is uh, a, the higher affinity molecule, the second generation molecule of legalizumab. So it's been studied uh, in patients with chronic urticaria. And here, this will be a study, a phase three multi-center study, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study for 52 weeks, assessing the effect of two different doses of legalizumab in patients with peanut allergy. Again, the, the primary outcome here is uh, the ability to tolerate uh, at least 1,000 milligrams of uh, therapy, uh, sorry, peanut protein after 12 weeks of therapy. And keep in mind, based on the, the data from the omalizumab that I showed, the likelihood that many of those patients will be able to tolerate at least a gram of protein is quite high, and many of them will probably even tolerate even larger amounts uh, with this therapy. The patients will be a little bit older, between 6 and 55 years of age, and have to have a peanut IG at least 6 units per liter at screening, and they have to react to a baseline challenge of a uh, single dose maximum of 100 milligrams. And the study should start hopefully uh, in December of this year, if not early next year. Turning out to uh, antibodies inhibiting interleukin-13, uh, IL-33 IL uh, IL is a pro-inflammatory uh, alarm that mediates atopic diseases through recruitment of pro-inflammatory cells. And this uh, alarm in IL-33 is produced um, associated with tissue damage uh, and can, through activation of different TH2, TH2 responses. And the IL, anti-IL-33 antibodies basically block the, block the production of IL-33 uh, and thus can decrease mast cell and basophile activation and the skewing that occurs towards a TH2 uh, pathway. Several companies are currently evaluating the use of this and I'll show one of those studies now. This is a phase two uh, study that was conducted at two sites in the United States, looking at 20 peanut allergic adults. Um, they had one infusion of anti-IL-33 antibody, and then they were assessed at day 15 and day 45 post um, therapy with food challenges. In figure A, you can see 73% of patients were able to tolerate at least uh, 275 milligrams of peanut protein. Uh, and Compared to placebo, again, this is a very low amount compared to the other studies, but there were not baseline challenges in this study. And figure B, uh, interestingly, you can see that uh, about half of those patients were able to tolerate 375 milligrams of peanut protein, and about a third of those had sustained effect at day 45. Again, this was just a one infusion in a small number of patients, but showing some benefit just from one dose. And figure C, you can see uh, the plotting of the cumulative tolerant dose at baseline and at day 15 and 45 with the active group generally showing an increase. The placebo group is not seen, but it's a, basically a flat line. So again, potential promise with the one in injection of anti-L33, it will hopefully go to phase three trials. And again, other companies are looking at this antibody as well. Uh, Dupilumab is... Uh, as mentioned before, is the IL-4 IL IL pathway 
It's been studied extensively now for patients with asthma, severe asthma and severe eczema and actually approved in the US for patients with severe eczema down to age six and severe asthma down to age uh, 12. I imagine those will also continue to go down in age for approval. And basically it inhibits, uh, it's an antibody against the common IL-4 alpha chain receptor, which is common to both the IL-4 and IL-13 uh, receptors. And by blocking that, it basically inhibit the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and have downstream effects on decreasing IgE production and eosinophil recruitment. Right now, there are four studies uh, that are being studied in the US on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, one looking at dupilumab as a monotherapy uh, for treatment of peanut allergic individuals. One looking at dupilumab in conjunction with peanut OIT. Uh, a Stanford-led study looking at milk OIT. And then a Stanford-led study also looking at the combination of omalizumab and dupilumab for treatment of patients with peanut allergy. Other biologics that are in the pipeline include anti-TSLP, as well as anti-IL-9 and IL-13, uh, which we studied um, with no trials right now uh, in any uh, phase at this point. Turning on to vaccines, uh, there are two vaccines I'll, I'll briefly review here. This is PBX-108, which is a vaccine that uses peptides that represent fragments of peanut proteins to switch off the allergic reaction to peanut. Unlike the other immunotherapies under development, these peptides don't contain the parts of the peanut proteins that cause the life-threatening reactions. Research shows that when these peptides interact with the immune cells in the absence of a, a pro-inflammatory uh, state, the immune cells can, that can cause the allergic reaction can be programmed, reprogrammed to be, become tolerant. Uh, the, this vaccine is a plan for a monthly intradermal injection to induce tolerance to peanuts and reduce, again, the risk of allergic reactions upon accidental exposure. They've done an initial phase one study in humans with the uh, first phase looking at a dose finding in eight cohorts of six peanut allergic adults, while stage two looked at multiple doses um, in 18 peanut allergic subjects. The data were presented in 2019 at Quad AI and Yaki, and essentially um, there were no safety concerns, no serious adverse events or adverse events of clinical concern, and only mild transient loca uh, local reactions. They hope to start uh, phase two trials. They're hoping to start, I think, this year, but most likely won't commence until next year. I believe that both the US and Australia are planned and looking at uh, children with peanut allergy with monthly injections and with few challenges done uh, at baseline and post-treatment. And there will be some evaluation reportedly of sustained unresponsiveness. The only other vaccine that's been studied is this Aralampvax, which is a DNA vaccine for peanut allergy. It's been studied in two phase uh, one trials. There's been no data that have been published. Um, looking initially at adults, uh, intramuscular versus intradermal injection versus placebo. And the one in adolescence is uh, reportedly recruiting, are still open, and we'll look at just high versus low dose intradermal injections versus placebo. Again, there are no uh, data that are available at this point time from these studies. But the second vaccine, looking at uh, intermittent injections, basically um, non daily therapy for looking at response to peanut desensitization. Here again, I'll, I'm happy to provide the slides. It's just to provide a, a brief overview of kind of the way I look at the different studies uh, and, and things that we use for OIT, sublingual, and EPIT. Um, again, I'm going to go into more detail of these on Sunday and my talk, so I'll just go briefly. As Mimi said, the, the Palisade trial was the Palisade trial was the large trial that led to the approval of AR101 or Palforzia of 500 uh, subjects. And after a year of therapy, the, the two thirds of those were able to tolerate a cumulative dose of about a gram of protein, with about half able to consume about two grams. Uh, so again, you'll see higher efficacy generally with OIT, with the higher dose that's used with the maintenance dose here of 300 milligrams. However, as, uh, as mentioned, there are higher rates of systemic reactions that occur with OIT given the oral route. So about 15% had systemic reactions and 10% had epinephrine use during the updosing and 8% during maintenance. 
generally the practicality of OIT is a little bit less just because uh, you have to go into the office to get up dose every two weeks with this product. You do have an increased risk of reaction for certain things like exercise or illness. And based on all therapies with OIT, about 15 to 20% drop out for various reasons. With sublingual, there really have not been as many studies with SLIT. I'll again go over into more detail. The two big studies of one to 11 year olds that Edward Kim did in North Carolina. But after three to five years of SLIT with two milligrams of daily therapy, two thirds were able to consume 750 milligrams, about half 1750 milligrams, and a quarter of them were able to consume five grams after three to five years of therapy. With this, you have less systemic side effects. Most of it are oropharyngeal. Um, in, very, in his studies, there have been no use of epinephrine uh, in using SLIT, but about 23% dropped out over those five years. Again, updosing was done in uh, the office or clinical trial setting. EPIT is going to have a slower rate of desensitization just because it's 250 micrograms to the skin. Um, so you'll see only about a third of those patients that the PEATS trial were able to reach an enlisting dose of at least 300 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams after a year of therapy. Most of the reactions are going to be skin related and get better over time. There were some systemic reactions, um, and I'll go over those again in more detail on Sunday, um, and all were mild to moderate. There is increased ease of using this product because there's no updosing. Uh, the titration of getting it to 24 hours a day is done at home, and exercise and infections don't seem to increase the risk of reacting. This is just a simple slide to show that the efficacy again of OIT is going to be the, the highest given the, the higher dose but the safety of it is gonna be less compared to SLIT and, and EPIC. While with SLIT and EPIC, you're gonna get less efficacy or lower rates of desensitization, the safety of it are gonna be higher on those two. So to summarize, uh, there'll be many potential peanut allergy immunotherapies that are under investigation right now, including the monoclonal antibodies and vaccines, as well as the SLIT, OIT, and EPIC, again, with one product for OIT being approved. Each of these investigational uh, therapies look at a different mechanism of action and treatment protocols with different advantages and disadvantages of those. We know that desensitization can be achieved, again, but as Mimi said, we really need to look at the long-term outcomes and those will require more investigation. The clinical results and some of which I showed suggest that penal allergic patients will have multiple treatment options at some point in the future, uh, which is great. And the benefits of these uh, must be weighed against the risk with each family and shared decision-making uh, needs to be utilized to determine with those families which therapy may be best and, and also consider avoidance as well as one of those options. And with that, I'll end.